Welcome one and all to episode 17 of the Dry Dock, and since we have had quite the number of new subscribers since the last time we actually spoke, I thought we could use the first few minutes of this Dry Dock to explain a few bits and pieces about the channel for those of you who have just joined us. So to lay things out briefly so as not to take up too much time, the format of the channel is a five minute guide released on Saturdays, followed by the Dry Dock, which you're listening to now, which is released on Sundays, um, except for patrons who get access to the Dry Dock one day early. Wednesdays see a special video, which is basically a prolonged in-depth look either at a ship or at a specific aspect of naval history, or technology and though obviously those come out on the Wednesdays and there might uh, often be more than one video as I also use Wednesdays as an opportunity to upload the revoiced versions of the old text-to-speech videos that marked the beginning of the channel so you might get some sort of maybe two or three uploads on a Wednesday sometimes and sometimes it'll just be one big video in terms of requesting ships, obviously people leave a request for ships in the comments. I do take on board every request that is made uh, for a ship to review. They go on a list. I appreciate the list on the description of the 5 Minute Guide videos on the Saturdays isn't fully comprehensive and that's because otherwise it would just get stupidly long. Um, I have something like 8 pages of requested ships at the moment and you, you really don't want a uh, video description that just goes on for about four screens. And in terms of the dry dock Q&A formula, uh, obviously the video description has all the timestamps for the various questions, and the questions are answered in the following way. So I cull as many tagged Q&A questions as I can from the uh, comment sections of the various videos themselves, and I keep those all in a list. So don't worry if you've asked a Q&A question, there's a 99% chance I've got it somewhere and I answer those questions for the first 20 minutes and then for the remaining period I answer questions that are taken from our discord server where we have a dry dock questions channel. The only exception to this format is that on the first dry dock of each month the patrons get to ask their questions and effectively skip the queue so they get their questions answered uh, in the first dry dock of each month. The only additional caveat I would put onto all of that is the fact that um, obviously not to look a gift horse in the mouth, but with so many extra people arriving, subscribing and commenting, um, it is getting harder and harder to actually go through all the comments of uh, the various videos that have been uploaded to grab the Q&A questions. So I will try, but as time goes on, I would encourage you if you uh, have a question you really, really want answered, probably best to uh, stick it in the Discord channel if at all possible, as th that is a just a full list of questions and I don't have to scroll through numerous other comments to find the Q&A questions like I do in the YouTube comments. But I, I, as I said, I, I will still try and trawl through the YouTube comments as best I can. And in a final note in relation to that, um, just because I don't answer your question the next week doesn't mean I've ignored it. Um, my list of questions for the dry dock culled from the comments is about 30 to 40 pages long, uh, depending on the day of the week. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I think the uh, questions for the dry dock are generally running about a month behind the comments on the videos. Uh, but if there is a particularly interesting follow-up question, something I mentioned in the previous dry dock, I will try and bring that forwards. So with all that said and done, that hopefully explains the format of the channel a little bit better. And I've already used up about four minutes of today's time. So let's get on with the actual questions. Craig Hagenbruch asks, did Vichy France have many Navy units other than those they inherited from the French Navy before Germany took over France? Well, the answer, at least as far as I can see, appears to be no, not anything major. Um, you've got the last French ships to be built, so you've got the Mogador-class destroyers, uh, the heavy cruiser Algerie, and obviously the Jean Bart, the, uh, the Richelieu-class battleship. 
But all of those were started, and in the case of the destroyers and the cruiser, finished before the start of the Second World War. And no further destroyers or cruisers were completed for the French Navy um, in the period of the Vichy French government. And of course, Jean Bart, although it was taken to Casablanca, it was basically in the same condition that it arrived, minus a bunch of its secondary weapons, which had been stripped out for harbour defence, um, when the Americans turned up for Operation Torch. So it doesn't appear that outside maybe one or two small light units, like a minesweepers or maybe the odd submarine, it doesn't seem like the Vichy French government actually completed any further naval units. Andrew Vuong asks, What events did the Australian Navy take part in during World War II? The Australian Navy actually took part in a surprising number of operations across the globe against the Axis forces during World War II. Uh, When they started out the war, they uh, were only an hour behind the UK in declaring war on Nazi Germany, and the Royal Australian Navy started off with two county-class heavy cruisers, Australia and Canberra, uh, three modified Leander-class cruisers, Hobart, Perth and Sydney, um, a much older cruiser, the Adelaide, four sloops, five destroyers, and some smaller craft. During the war, obviously, some of these would be lost, but they'd actually finished the war with over double the number of destroyers in commission. They picked up six frigates, over 50 corvettes, and a bunch of landing ships and minor auxiliary craft, including store ships and boater launches, air sea rescue vessels, and things such as that. The overall strength, again accounting for losses, went from approximately 13 ships to well over 330 by June 1945. The first main theatre of action the Australian Navy saw was actually in the Mediterranean, and they committed a good portion of their overall combat strength to this endeavour, supporting the Royal Navy efforts against Italian, German and Vichy French forces, with a surprising degree of success only losing one sloop to a torpedo attack and losing a destroyer to an air attack. Although, on a happy note, despite being hit by a Junkers 87 Stuka dive bomber, the only casualty on board was one man who was injured by being hit by a flying can of bully beef, so they lost a ship, but nobody got killed. And in exchange, racked up a kill tally that included several Italian submarines, a couple of Italian destroyers, and an Italian light cruiser. They would also perform a number of convoy escort duties in the Indian Ocean, and this was obviously notably where HMAS Sydney was lost in a mutual kill with a German auxiliary cruiser. But with the declaration of war by Japan, the Royal Australian Navy quite understandably had to pull its larger ships home to help protect the home country from attacks by Japanese ships. Since the US 7th Fleet formed up at Brisbane in Australia for operations against the Japanese Empire, many Royal Australian Navy ships would serve as part of 7th Fleet task forces. This theatre of war would see the two other major Australian surface losses of the Second World War, with HMAS Perth being sunk in the Battle of the Sunda Strait, and HMAS Canberra being lost off Guadalcanal. Conversely, Australian ships would form part of the escort for American task forces at a number of key engagements, including the Battle of the Coral Sea and the Battle of Leyte Gulf, which meant that they were able to get a degree of revenge on the Imperial Japanese Navy for these losses. In particular, the Canberra's replacement HMAS Shropshire would fire multiple 8-inch broadsides at the Japanese battleship Yamashiro during the Battle of Surigao Strait, contributing to its sinking. W.C. Weath asks, how far did all the signatories of the Washington Naval Treaty push the limits? So basically, in terms of the fleets that actually mattered, you can divide this into two camps. You have the British, French and American navies, which did their level best to stick to the treaty limits. And you have the Italian and Japanese navies, who really didn't. I mean, the Italians at least gave lip service to the idea with the Littorios coming in at only 40,000 tonnes displacement. The Japanese kind of just sat there, seethed for a bit, and then walked out and built the Yamatos. So, yeah, they paid practically no attention to it. 
The Germans can technically be lumped into that second group as well, so they weren't original signatories to the Washington Naval Treaty. Uh, their later naval treaty with the UK that was supposed to allow them to build up a navy again did hold them to the same limits as everybody else, but of course they went ahead and built the Bismarcks, which were, apart from the Amptos, probably the single biggest middle finger to the Washington Naval Treaties that were ever built. Donald Palmrose asks, There are often diagonal tubes or pipes evenly spaced all down the sides of the hulls of warships prior to and during World War I. Were these anti-torpedo booms? If so, how did they work? Were they effective? And why were they removed? This is a question that's been answered before, but since quite a lot of our new subscribers have actually been asking this in the comments, I thought I'd answer it here again. So yes, these are folded-in anti-torpedo net booms, and when a ship goes to anchor, they would be folded out, and the idea was that a ship could protect itself from torpedo attack whilst in port by having these anti-torpedo nets out to catch the torpedoes. Uh, the answer as to why they were removed is basically as you said they didn't really work that well against the early torpedoes that they people worrying about maybe around 1900 they were somewhat effective but as torpedoes got bigger heavier and faster they were less and less effective they couldn't be used while the ship was underway and they were quite heavy and complicated and just made the ships less efficient so when it became clear that as defensive measures they actually weren't up to all that much anymore they were taken off and much much heavier anti-torpedo nets were installed that were supposed to protect the harbour generally although these had varying degrees of success thunderstruck 170 asks did other nations besides the United States mothball a majority of ships after World War II for future use, or was that unique to the United States Navy? Well, it was almost unique to the United States Navy. Almost every other navy was left with little to no shipping by the end of the war, so they needed to build up, and basically not anything that wasn't serviceable would be scrapped. They weren't in a position to mothball anything in particular. The primary exception to this where the navy was left with too many ships and needed to mothball a bunch was the royal navy um, there were a bunch of older ships like unfortunately the war spite the other queen elizabeth the surviving revenge class etc that all went off to the scrapyards but the royal navy did have quite large commitments under the early nato treaties and so a significant portion of some of the more modern ships were actually sent into mothballs. As a result, the Royal Navy would mothball quite a number of light cruisers, destroyers, and the King George V class of battleships. A number of British carriers would also go into reserve, but most of them were scrapped fairly quickly um, in favour of retaining the ones that they wanted to keep operational. Mark Rose has a question about anti-aircraft guns on the American Navy in World War II. Specifically, um, was it not that they faced the greatest threat from air attack in the Pacific, and also how effective were they against Japanese air attacks? In terms of their effectiveness against Japanese air attacks, the very first um, sets of engagements that the Americans fought against the Japanese didn't show their anti-aircraft batteries to be particularly good but this was because they'd basically just been dropped into the middle of a world war and so they were still stuck with a lot of pre-war anti-aircraft armament. However the lessons of Pearl Harbor were fairly rapidly learned and most US ships by some point in the middle of 1942 were beginning to sport more and more and more anti-aircraft weaponry. This was greatly assisted by two things. One was the development of the superb Mark 37 anti-aircraft fire control system which allowed a much greater degree of accuracy um, for the anti-aircraft guns because of course it doesn't matter how many guns you have if you can't actually hit anything with them and secondly was the development of the VT proximity fuse now that was a major game changer as it meant that you could fire fairly heavy caliber shells such as 5 inch anti-aircraft shells and reasonably rely on it, them detonating and doing damage if they got somewhere in the vicinity of an enemy aircraft
When you combine those two things and add in the sheer number of guns the Americans would put on their ships, you were pretty much guaranteed to hit something if you threw up enough um, enough lead. And there was the additional uh, psychological factor of even if you didn't hit something, if a pilot is flying towards what appears to be just a solid wall of tracer and flak explosions, they are going to be rather discouraged from continuing on a straight and level course, and since a straight and level course is what is needed to most effectively dive bomb or torpedo ships, it probably saved as many American ships simply by um, diverting Japanese aircraft and forcing them onto non-optimal approaches as it did from physically shooting them down. And when it came to shooting them down, the anti-aircraft batteries obviously got better and better and better as the war went on. And eventually um, they were considered to be pretty much the most effective AA batteries of the war. Now, in terms of whether or not they faced the greatest threat from air attack, this varies. Um, so obviously, as I said, Pearl Harbor rather heavily emphasized to them the dangers of air attack. Um, however, various Japanese efforts to engage the American Navy in surface action um, also proved quite deadly, with quite a number of early American losses being these surface actions. So it's not strictly that the greatest threat was from air attack, although air attack could be quite deadly, but it was something that they were very much aware of um, due to, as I said, the events of Pearl Harbor. As far as whether or not they faced the greatest threat of the war to a navy, um, that is somewhat questionable. It, I mean, as I said before, it does vary somewhat. Um, in the early parts of the war, I would actually argue that the area that was under the most threat from air attack was probably the ships operating in the Mediterranean Sea, mainly because obviously you had the unsinkable aircraft carrier of Italy, and once Flieger Corps 10 came in, there were attacks by, the, by hundreds of aircraft with individual attacks being made by sort of three or four squadrons at, at a time. You had anything from sort of 30 to 40 to maybe even 60 dive or torpedo bombers showing up at once. Now, whilst the uh, carrier battles in the first half of the Pacific War did involve similar numbers of sort of uh, high tens to low hundreds of aircraft because they were being launched from actual aircraft carriers and therefore arriving in much smaller packets these attacks tended to be spaced out considerably more so the typical attack on an american carrier at say coral sea or midway would be maybe something along the lines of a dozen to a couple of dozen uh, strike craft at any given time maybe edging up towards the high 30s and then there would be a bit of slack time whilst the carriers recovered their aircraft rearmed refueled and tried to strike again whereas when you're in the Mediterranean it could be a case of maybe anything up to nearly a thousand aircraft attacking you over the course of a single day as I say coming in in fairly large batches so for the majority of that period um, the Pacific was probably the second greatest threat area to uh, ships in terms of aircraft, but as the Americans pressed on closer and closer to the Japanese home islands, um, once you get to places like uh, Saipan, Iwo Jima and Okinawa, then the sheer number and scale of Japanese air attacks became uh, even greater than those that were faced in the Mediterranean, and obviously there were a lot of kamikazes in there which made the uh, operation rather more hazardous than American and Italian pilots, sorry, than German and Italian pilots, I should say, who actually obviously wanted to go home at the end of the day. And of course there is also the fact that in the Mediterranean when you're facing off against the Germans especially, um, the Germans did tend to carry and use much more effective um, dive bombs and other munitions including things like the Fritz X and the HS-129 uh, I believe it was guided missile. White Whale asks, would stripping the Revenge class of their main guns and outfitting them as pure anti-aircraft ships have been a viable way of increasing their usefulness in a war that saw them very quickly obsolete? In some specific circumstances possibly, but in general not so much, because whilst in the Mediterranean they were actually fairly viable combat units, and although the uh, Royal Navy battle line speed was less than the Italian, um, the Italians 
showed a fair reluctance to engage their opposite numbers in battleship duels. Um, when they were assigned to the Indian Ocean, although the Royal Navy very clearly acknowledged that they didn't rate their chances that highly if they came up against the full battle line of the Japanese fleet, it did keep the Japanese fleet guessing and occupied for a good amount of time. Um, outside of that... Their primary use, to be honest, was actually convoy security. And that was for the reason that, although they were slow, their heavy armour and quite obviously still fearsome uh, main battery of 15-inch guns meant that they were very, very good at discouraging any and practically all German surface raiders because anything outside of maybe the Bismarck or the Tirpitz would probably not come out very well in a straight-up gunfight with a revenge class. And at that point, the fact that they were slow didn't really affect them that much because their job wasn't to try and chase down the enemy, their job was to protect the convoy, and they were still faster than the convoy ships. Um, this is actually borne out by the fact that when Scharnhorst and Gneisenor went out on uh, various raids in the Atlantic, on at least one occasion, they came across a convoy that had an old R-Class toodling along with it, and just at one look at the situation and went, nope, we're going to go off and find easier targets. Nathan Bretain asks, um, why did the USN never use a 15-inch gun? The answer to this was that they had the 14-inch gun. Um, now, obviously, the 14-inch gun is not quite as effective as the 15-inch 42, but the Americans discovered that on a ship of a similar displacement, you could get three of them into a turret, as opposed to the two that you could get into a turret using the 15-inch weapon. And so the standard class became equipped with 14-inch guns, and there was obviously a desire with it being, you know, the standard class to try and have commonality of parts and equipment with obviously having the United States Navy and the Royal Navy having graduated out of the 12-inch gun phase. Um, the British had gone for the 13 and a half, and the Americans had gone for the 14, then the British had gone up to the 15. Uh, but the difference in uh, firepower com between the 14 and the 15-inch, although it was there, was not enough to motivate the Americans to lose four guns from their design and to uh, cause a difference in gun caliber, shells, and flight characteristics for the standard class. And of course, when the time came to upgrade, it's well, there was the point of, well, why equal an enemy when you can try and do better, or a potential enemy at least? So with the Germans and the British both fielding 15-inch gunned ships, once Congress agreed to escalate their own caliber, they went straight from the 14-inch to the 16-inch, and the 16-inch is where the US gun caliber would remain pretty much for the rest of their battleship building era. Christopher Louis asks, what if HMS Indomitable had been able to accompany Task Force Z in December 1941? Would that have saved Prince of Wales and Repulse? If so, would the presence of those three capital ships have saved Singapore from falling to the Japanese? Well, assuming that she didn't go aground and assuming that she got to the area in time, I was ordered there uh, in time, I think Indomitable probably could have guaranteed the survival of Force Z. Now, this is for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is she brings a not inconsiderable anti-aircraft battery with her, of 16 4.5-inch AA guns plus a bunch of closer-in weapons, uh, which would have helped in more general terms. But secondly is that unlike uh, many of the air attacks that took place in the Pacific War later on, this air attack was prosecuted pretty much entirely by bombers. There wasn't any fighter escort, and the bombers themselves were fairly big twin-engined machines, not uh, the single-engine types that you'd got off carriers. So with the practical uh, combat capability of Indomitable against these being its AA battery plus one squadron of Fulmer fighters and one squadron of Sea Hurricanes, I think they would have done pretty well for themselves. I mean, you're talking about a couple of dozen fighters, uh, no fighter opposition, and whilst the Fulmar is not exactly the world's best fighter, it's going after unescorted twin-engine bombers along with Hurricanes, and... Well, yeah, just ask the Luftwaffe what happens when twin-engine bombers get set upon unescorted. 
doesn't tend to end very well for them. So I think between the attacks themselves being heavily broken up and with attackers shot down by the uh, Royal Navy fighters and the additional AA firepower provided by the Indomitable, I think Forsaid would have weathered that air attack quite nicely. Um, whether or not it would have saved Singapore from falling the, to the Japanese, I'm not so sure. The Japanese, if they hadn't been able to sink Forsaid with aircraft, probably would have tried to move in with, for a naval engagement, a more conventional surface one, and who knows how that would have gone. Um, but to be honest, the main <laughs> the main reason Singapore fell was because the Japanese army showed up coming in from the side that nobody expected them to come from, and one aircraft carrier and a couple of capital ships are very unlikely to be able to prevent that. I mean, they, they could, in theory, just bombard the Japanese formations as they come forward, but there's only a limited amount of ammunition on those ships, and the Japanese have considerably more men and ships that they can muster. So they might have delayed the fall of Singapore, but I don't think they would have prevented it. On to the Discord questions, and a number of different people all asked about naval camouflage, why it was done, what its purpose was. So, broadly, naval camouflage in the Second World War and the surrounding period falls into one of three categories. You have concealment, deception, and disruption. Now, the concealment camouflages tend to be the more sim simple ones, and these are designed purely to try and make the ship blend in with its surrounding environment so that it's not spotted quite as easily. So you have a lot of uh, camouflages, like, say, the Japanese Navy camouflages, a lot of them were expected to fight in and around islands, so bizarrely enough for ships at sea, they sometimes would sport green not blotchy camouflages that wouldn't look out of place on an army uniform, uh, and that was designed to help them blend into the background of islands that they were supposed to be defending. But a variety of greys and blues were also applied to various ships on the principle of blending into the sky and sea for obvious reasons. And you can kind of tell the environments the ships were operating in because the American Navy, which was primarily thinking of operating in the wonderful clear skies, mostly of the Pacific, tended to go for various shades of blue, whereas the British, who operated in the North Sea and the oceans in and around the UK, went for varying pleasing shades of grey, because they knew what the weather was going to be like. You then have the slightly more uh, complex deceptive camouflages, and these were mainly designed on the basis of expecting the ships to be seen, but then trying to throw off the people who had seen them. So this consisted of a number of uh, different techniques, but some of the more common ones were trying to disguise the ship as a smaller ship, um, and this would use camouflage as well. So you'd, you'd paint the hull something really obvious and stand out like black, but you'd paint maybe the bow and stern in a much more camouflage type color like a light gray or a blue with the idea being that at long distance with the haze of long range spotting and maybe even actual sea fog and mist um, people would look and see oh well there's a big solid outline and maybe lose the ends of the ship in uh, in in the murk and then they would think that they are facing a smaller ship than they otherwise were um, so maybe a battleship would look like a cruiser, a cruiser would look like a destroyer, etc, etc. Um, so these were deceptive uh, camouflages. The other ones that used this basis would also do things like, say, paint a false bow wave on the front of the ship, a little white curl. And at long range, the idea was to make it look like the ship was going a lot faster than it actually was, which was especially important in an era when torpedo attack was quite common, because if the... Uh, submarine or aircraft that was attacking thought, oh, well, the ship has a bow wave, it's clearly travelling at 30 knots, I will aim my torpedo so far ahead, then if the ship's actually cruising along at 20 knots, the torpedo's going to massively overshoot. Um, there were a few experiments as well to make people, to make ships look like uh, they were going backwards, but um, that's somewhat harder to pull off, because people tend to be pretty good at working out which direction a ship is actually going within a few moments. And finally, we have the disruptive camouflages. So these are all the really weird and wonderful ones where you have checkerboards, zigzags, all sorts of weird and wonderful random shapes. And these are primarily designed to 
A, break up the ship's uh, visual signature, because it's much more difficult for the human eye to try and make sense of it all. But one of the major um, reasons for this is actually to do with optical rangefinders, because optical rangefinders um, use two widely spaced um, sets of uh, effectively telescopes, and the idea is you merge the two together and that tells you what the range is uh, through trigonometry. However, with the kind of very disruptive camouflage schemes, it would, in theory, become a very, very difficult to actually um, align the two images properly because you, it's very difficult to match up um, to a very, very disrupted images. And so then the enemy would either be unable to guess the range or would guess incorrectly. Um, of course, this relied on everyone using the same kind of rangefinder, which wasn't actually the case. And the primary opponent that such camouflage schemes were designed against, which was the German Navy, actually didn't use optical fire control equipment that was affected by this at all. So yeah, it looked nice and funny, but broadly it wasn't spectacularly effective. Vanguard The Last Bottle Sheep says... What if the RMS Olympic was converted to a carrier? Well, the Olympic was a 45,000 ton passenger liner, so that would have been quite interesting. But on the other hand, being built pre-World War I, her top speed was 24 knots or thereabout, and consumed a fantastic amount of fuel in order to do so. So if you're going to do that, you'll be talking about maybe an interwar refit that somehow gets past the Washington Naval Treaty, um, where her engines are completely replaced with modern units that let her get up to a speed that's useful for flight deck operations. But assuming that oh, you get past all of those roadblocks, the fact of the matter is this ship is freaking huge. Um, it's as big as a... Lexington class aircraft carrier or battle cruiser at the time, I guess. Um, but obviously, being a passenger ship, it's it's got an awful lot of capacity. Um, so once you've raised off the superstructure and the funnels, retrunked it all presumably as part of your engine upgrades, and converted it into a carrier, it probably would have the single largest aircraft capacity of any interwar period carrier, assuming the British don't do something incredibly stupid like try and armour the damn thing. Um, but since they only brought that in in the mid-30s, I doubt they would have. Um, obviously, as with the Lexingtons, it would have suffered from being a converted ship, but its overall durability and lifespan I don't think would have been as long as the Lexingtons, um, purely because being a merchant vessel, a uh, passenger vessel, it's built to merchant standards, whereas the Lexingtons at least were built to, to military standards as battle cruisers before being converted. Um, so you're probably looking at something which has a uh, aircraft capacity in the high 60s through to maybe the low 80s, depending on the type of aircraft it's carrying. Um, and I suspect probably would have been fairly useful in service, but probably would have also worn itself out quite, uh, quite a lot. So assuming it's not destroyed in some manner during the Second World War, it would have been scrapped pretty much instantly after the war was over. Duke of Stirling House asks um, if I could preserve one ship that was historically scrapped as a museum ship, which ship would that be? And what is your opinion of the merchant aircraft carriers? Were they worth it or were they unnecessary? Well, the first part is quite quick. As any uh, viewer of long-term viewer of the channel will know, my answer is immediately HMS Warspite. Um, so, yep. Closely followed by USS Enterprise, but war spike because we don't have any preserved battleships in Britain, unfortunately, which makes me quite sad. But anyway, um, so yeah, that's your answer for that bit. As for merchant aircraft carriers, well, <laughs> let's have a look. So for those of you not aware, the merchant aircraft carriers were basically, well, as the term suggests, literally a bunch of merchant ships, uh, mostly grain carriers and oil tankers that were taken, had the upper surfaces of their deck stripped off, refitted with very basic aircraft handling facilities and used as very effectively very slow light aircraft carriers for convoy escort, mostly using swordfish biplanes. Now, 
They were replaced during the war by full-fledged escort carriers once they were available, but I definitely think they were worth it. They launched numerous anti-submarine operations, they improved the morale of the convoys, and although a few ships would be lost in uh, convoys that were escorted by the merchant aircraft carriers, they did manage to disrupt the concentration of U-boats ahead of convoys, and they managed to force uh, U-boats away, keep them uh, submerged, etc. So they had a fairly important role in suppressing U-boat activity, which no doubt preserved many, many lives. And at the time that they were um, used, as I said, there just weren't enough escort carriers going around. So it was that or nothing. And given their effectiveness, I think they were, they were definitely worth the investment. And finally, uh, Springfield Chan asks, to what extent did the Royal Navy fight with the US Navy in the Pacific Theatre in the late months of World War II? I've heard the Royal Navy was sailing with the USN at major island landings, but I can't find any good sources. Also, I know that HMAS Canberra was part of the cruiser division at Coral Sea, um, but then I read about Savo Island at Guadalcanal, and there's another ship called Canberra, or even USS Canberra in some sources, was this the same ship? Well, that coincided well with the question on the Australian Navy, didn't it? Um, so, the HMAS Canberra, as you said, was part of the cruiser division at Coral Sea. It was then sunk uh, during the Guadalcanal campaign. USS Canberra also existed. This was actually a ship that was named in honour of the sacrifice of HMAS Canberra um, and was brought into service later in the war. So there were actually two Canberras in service, one belonging to the Australian Navy and then subsequently another one of a completely different design belonging to the American Navy in World War II. Now, as for the Royal Navy fighting in the Pacific Theatre alongside the United States Navy, this is a little bit of a delicate subject when it comes to the two respective uh, navies, and I shall explain why. So, as 1944 wound on, and it became very clear that by this point the Kriegsmarine basically didn't have much left to threaten the Royal Navy with, the British started to redeploy more and more ships to fight the Japanese in the Pacific. Um, they knew that it was going to be primarily a carrier war, so they didn't send some of their older and slower ships, and instead would only send the obviously the faster ships that could keep up with the carriers. And this would actually eventually add up to a fairly formidable force, with a final fleet strength of six fleet carriers, um, four lighter carriers, a couple of maintenance carriers to help keep everything running, um, nine escort carriers, four battleships consisting of the entirety of the surviving King George V class, um, 11 cruisers of various types, and 35 destroyers, 14 frigates, and nearly 100 support and other smaller warships. So it was a fairly considerable uh, fleet, actually. The USN referred to them as Task Force 57 or Task Force 37, depending on whether they were accompanying the 5th Fleet or the 3rd Fleet, much in the same way as the American Fast Carrier Task Force was Task Force 58 or Task Force 38 when it was operating with those respective fleets. Now, the British did have some issues, primarily around resupply of ships and aircraft at sea, as they'd always relied primarily on the fact the Royal Navy had bases all over the place, whereas obviously advancing through the Japanese-held areas of the Pacific, this was no longer the case, and having to shuttle a couple of thousand miles back just to resupply and rearm was not possible. So they had to go through a bit of a crash course in American methods of resupply at sea in for refueling, restocking, etc. And... The reason you don't hear so much about the British Pacific Fleet compared to other actions and fleets of World War II is partially down to one person. That's Admiral Ernest King, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Fleet. To say that he disliked the British would be something of an understatement. He loathed and hated them for some bizarre reason um, and really, really, really did not want the Royal Navy anywhere near what he saw as his fleet's operational area. 
to be fair, King seemed to hate everybody outside the United States Navy. Um, apparently, according to some British observers, he hated the US Army almost as much as he seemed to hate the Royal Navy. But there you go. To be fair, he did raise some valid objections, mostly surrounding the differences in equipment that the British and the Americans used, uh, but mostly his resistance seemed to be just down to the fact he, he didn't like them, and as a result, uh, President Roosevelt overruled him and basically told him to get on with it and live with it. Although forced into accepting the British presence in the Pacific, he would then do his level best to make sure they never worked alongside the US Navy as much as was possible. Although in practice, cooperation between the British and American units did gradually get closer and closer, as on a purely operational level, the two navies didn't really have much of a problem with each other. There was also, when the fleets were operating together, quite the illicit trade going on between the American ships, who had large supplies of ice cream, which the British rather wanted, and the British ships, who had large supplies of rum and other alcohol, which the American sailors really wanted. Although Admiral Halsey, whilst not being quite as bad as Admiral King, did actually refuse to allow the British to take part in some raids on uh, the Japanese home islands purely on a political basis and he admits as much in his memoirs um, which probably cost a few more lives than the raids otherwise would have. But as I said both fleets would cooperate together bombarding the Japanese home islands supporting the invasion of Okinawa and various other activities um, with the performance of the supermarine sea fires being quite useful in combat air patrol as it freed up the Hellcats and Corsairs to carry ordnance in low-level attacks on Japanese positions, whilst the excellent high-altitude performance of the sea fires made them perfectly suited to break up and attack incoming Japanese um, air raids and kamikaze strikes. It was also during this period that you got the wonderful quote from a USN liaison officer on the Indefatigable, um, as the British Pacific Fleet during the invasion of Okinawa was assigned to suppress kamikaze uh, staging airfields, with all the inherent risks that that entailed, and whilst the British fleet carriers would be hit um, by a number of kamikaze attacks, he specifically quoted in a letter that when a kamikaze hits a US carrier, it means six months of repair at Pearl Harbor. When a kamikaze hits a limey carrier, it's just a case of sweepers man your brooms. And that was a result of, of the uh, Royal Navy's armoured flight decks quite happily rejecting almost every hit encountered from a kamikaze but that particular armored versus unarmored flight deck issue is something that's for a special video in the future and this now constitutes pretty much the full run of the dry docks uh, question and answer time since we did have a little bit of housekeeping at the beginning so thank you very much for listening and we'll see you again in the next video